All right. Let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Roland Vogel. I'm uh, Executive Director of Codex, uh, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics. Um, welcome to our second uh, Codex Future Law Conference. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that uh, a year has gone by since our first uh, Future Law Conference uh, last April. And uh, it's, really, it's really amazing um, you know, how quickly things are changing in our, in, in our industry. It's, um, it's really uh, quite uh, breathtaking and uh, exhilarating. Um, and, uh, and really, many of the innovators who are uh, driving the change in our legal system uh, by automating, disaggregating, unbundling, and uh, redesigning legal services up and down the legal supply chain are uh, here with us today. So, so this is promising to be a great day for um, exchanging ideas, uh, generating new ideas, and um, you know, also checking in with friends and, and making some new friends. So uh, we've put together what uh, we think is a very interesting uh, and exciting program for uh, today, uh, including five panels of uh, leading experts and, uh, and three keynotes. So our first um, keynote will be uh, from Professor, Professor uh, Richard Suskind, uh, who's uh, going to be joining us uh, from the UK um, uh, via WebEx. Uh, his uh, keynote is entitled, The Future of Lawyers from uh, Denial to Disruption. And uh, after Professor Suskin's keynote, we'll start with our uh, first uh, panel on uh, forging an open uh, legal document system. And uh, that will be followed by uh, a panel on uh, managing uh, legal marketplaces. Uh, that will take us into uh, our luncheon. Uh, the luncheon keynote uh, will be given by uh, Professor Dan Siciliano from the law school. Uh, after that, we'll be talking about uh, rebuilding uh, legal education, um, and that will be followed by a panel on uh, legal technology in the public interest, uh, and um, you know, so access to justice, by the way, is really at the heart of, of Codex's uh, mission, uh, and so we're particularly uh, excited also having a, a you know, panel of experts on, 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 on that topic. Um, and, uh, and a final panel will be on uh, legal ethics in the, in the age of machines. And uh, we'll be closing the day with a, with a, a keynote by um, uh, the Codex Research Director, Professor Genesaret. Um, he will be speaking, uh, his, 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 his keynote is titled The Cop in the Backseat, Embedding Law in Everyday Life. Um, so, so this, I think, will be an uh, exciting day, um, and, uh, and I want to just uh, spend uh, uh, just a few seconds uh, thanking uh, a few folks who, uh, who actually uh, made this event uh, possible. So my special, be uh, special thanks belongs uh, to our uh, generous conference partner, uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, Thomson is, uh, is not only our conference partner for the, uh, for the future law conference, but has come on board as an affiliate of, of Codex um, and is um, more broadly support the, supporting the work of our center and our students. And, um, and we feel that, that, that much innovation will uh, flow from this, from this partnership. So, uh, so thank you, uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, it's great to have you on board. Uh, big thank you, of course, also to, um, to our uh, Codex fellow, uh, Tim Wang. Uh, and uh, where's Tim? So there he is. Um, and uh, and also his uh, colleague Sao Wei Wang from from Robots, Robots and Wang, uh, a really uh, a growing big law firm, uh, uh, Amlaw 200 firm, in uh, in the Bay Area. Um, uh, Tim has uh, has uh, worked tirelessly with us to to put this event together. So thank you very much, Tim. Um, and, um, and thank you also to uh, the Stanford uh, Law School Program Group, uh, who's uh, uh, been really working very hard on, on making sure that um, all things actually getting, get, getting done. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's get started with our first keynote. Um, 
Our first keynote is uh, Professor Richard Soskind. Uh, <laughs> Professor Soskind hardly uh, needs any introduction. Um, I will try to give one uh, anyways. Um, uh, Professor Soskind really uh, has you know, almost created the field of, of, uh, of legal technology. Uh, he's, uh, he's an author, uh, speaker, and uh, uh, independent advisor to, to many uh, professional firms and governments. Uh, his, uh, his expertise is uh, really on the future of, uh, professional, of professional services, in particular, the future of the, of the legal profession. Um, and, uh, and he really, I mean, he really foresaw, you know, 16 years ago, a lot of the things that, we, that we're witnessing uh, today. Uh, and he was really right on the mark with, with uh, most of his predictions. Um, he has worked on legal technology for over 30 years. Uh, he lectures uh, internationally and, and has written, you know, many of the key works in the field. Uh, including uh, his most recent book, um, Tomorrow's Lawyers, um, then The End of Lawyers, and, uh, and The Future of Law. Uh, so those are really the standards in the field. He's an, uh, the IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice in the UK. He's uh, president of uh, the Society for Computers and Law. Uh, he's uh, chair of the advisory board of the Oxford Internet Institute. He's an honorary professor at UCL Faculty of Laws, emeritus professor, emeritus Gresham Professor of Law, and he's a uh, he's, uh, professor at uh, uh, University of Strathclyde um, Law School, uh, and he's also the chair of the advisory panel of the public sector information. So the list goes on and on. He's uh, uncountable uh, awards uh, um, to, his, uh, to his name, and so, uh, so it's a real, real uh, Pleasure and honor to have uh, uh, Richard Suskind uh, join us from the cloud today, and uh, and so without further ado, I'll I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It, it's a little bit strange presenting from London, anywhere in the world, but I just want to make sure I've ever been wearing with people. Raise their hands wildly because there are sounds being muted at your end, so that means I can't hear anything. So I just want to check. Can anyone raise just to see what everyone's up there and you can see me word? Excellent, good. Now, the first thing I wanted to say, and it's often said to be rude to disagree with the person who introduces you, but I always like to remind people that the title of my 2008 book was The End of Lawyers? Question mark, not The End of Lawyers, with no question mark. Uh, punctuation is very important to lawyers. Never has been a piece of punctuation been so important to someone's career. I would say it would be the end of my career exclamation mark if I didn't have that, that mark at the end of it. So I spent a lot of time speaking, and earlier in the week I was giving a talk to some tax accountants. So I thought I'd start off with some humor. And I said to them, well, I really explained to them that what I do for a living is speak to lawyers. So I said to them, so it was nice today to be addressing a live audience. That was a joke. It's not my funniest joke, but amongst tax accountants, that's a good one. They were all rolling in the aisles at the time. And that made me think and made me wonder uh, what a live performance now is. I'm not sure if this is live. And as video conferencing, desktop to desktop telepresence improves, I think we'll lose track of what it is to be in a, in a live environment. But I uh, regret to not looking first at the point I want to make. Back in 1983, when I was uh, just about to embark on my bus in Oxford, I visited Stanford for the first and only time, uh, the AI lab. And in fact, the uh, the work that was going on there influenced my own thinking about what approach to take, which was, in the end was what was known as a rule-based expert systems approach. And so I get huge regard for Stanford. I remember the campus with, uh, with great pleasure, great place. So uh, maybe one day I'll join you. But for now, what I wanted to do, and uh, I'm assuming I changed slides there, so if I haven't do wait, I'm not going to do that for a good slide. I just want to check one of those day. Uh, what I've got here, therefore, is really the structure of the day for the next half hour or so. And I want to really present in groups of three, three old chestnuts, then suggest you what the three drivers of change in the legal marketplace are, move on to suggest what I think are three major technology developments, and ultimately suggest to you the three stages through which our legal industry is traveling, and finally leave you with three challenges, which I hope set you up for the day. So the three old chestnuts, for those of you who've heard this before, you'll have heard the use of just sit back, relax, and enjoy them again. For those of you who haven't, they're pivotal to my way of thinking. The first is the story of Wayne Gretzky, 
the finest ice hockey player of all time, arguably, asked not long ago, why are you such a wonderful ice hockey player? And he said it's because I've skated to where the top is going to be rather than where it once was. And the lesson here for lawyers is very clear. When you're thinking strategically about a, as a practitioner or indeed in a law school about where you're going in relation to legal technology and future legal services, our challenge is not to optimize and streamline what we do today. Our challenge is somehow to project ahead to think, well, what's the world going to be like in 2025? What will the economy be like? What will technology be like? What will the competition be like? What will what our clients want? That's the kind of mindset one has to have. One has to leap ahead, have some vision of where we're going, and then direct your own research or business development or career development in that same direction. So that's the, the challenge for us. And what I want to do today is give you some sense of where that path might end up. My next old chestnut still story of Atom Decker, who are, of course, one of the world's leading manufacturers and power tools. And apparently, when they recruit new executives, they take them off on a course. And they sit them down in a room, and they put up the slide before you and say, this is what we sell, isn't it? The media executives all get rather surprised at it. They say, what's that? Well, that's Atom Decker. The traders, with some satisfaction, say, that's not actually what we sell, because that's not fundamentally what our clients want, our customers want. This is what our customers want. And it's your job to find ever more creative, competitive, and imaginative ways of giving our customers what they want. And I'm assuming you've got a picture of a whole neatly drilled piece of wood in front of you just now. But the point here for lawyers is that very often when we're thinking of our future, we tend to be a power drill mentality. We tend to think, what do we do today and how can we make it a bit quicker or cheaper or better? Not often enough do we take a step back and ask, what's the fundamental value we bring across? Why is it that Clients pay for our services. What's the role of the law in the legal services market? And that's a question I've been asking for many years, and I hope it's one of the questions you address today. Because when thinking as you are about legal technology, one has to think not so much how you automate, and this is my third introductory point in the old chestnut, not so much how you automate what we already do as lawyers, but it's the opportunities for innovation that I find interesting. Automation, in my terms at least, is what many people think of when they think of information technology. You take some kind of task or process or organization or activity and you streamline it, you computerize it, optimize, motorize, all these kinds of words. But what you're basically doing is taking some often inefficient pre-existing manual process and applying computer technology to it. And that's all very well and it does us a good job in so many areas of life. But as well as it's across the world that the really market changing, industry altering applications of information technology, I find they're not examples of automation at all. The illustrations of what I call innovation. And innovation, in my terms, is when you use information technology to do things that previously weren't possible. So it's not a question simply of automating what we already do in 2014. That, for me, is not the big challenge of legal technology. The big challenge is to look at existing and emerging technologies and see if this can help us change the way we work. I echo the sentiment of your, your institute and your center that what you're trying to do is increase access to justice. I agree with this wholeheartedly. But my guess is that the way we do that is not simply by automating the current legal profession, it's by identifying particularly internet-based ways of offering access in new, different, easier, less forbidding ways uh, of provision of, of legal services, legal guidance, legal information. Many people are very skeptical of this. They say, well, you can't actually innovate through technology. And to the skeptic I often point this technology, the ATM, the cash dispenser, one of the most successful information technologies of the last 30 or 40 years, but if you have an automation mindset, that's to say, if you think that all computer systems really do is automate some pre-existing, often inefficient, manual process, I put down this challenge. What pre-existing inefficient manual process did the ATM computerize? Was it the case that 30 years ago, in the middle of the night, when you needed money, you went down to the local bank and there was some poor person sitting there, and there's a big hole in the wall, and you knelt down and you said, $50, please, now came a hand clutching notes. It wasn't that that process existed, and some bankers got round the table and said, come on, chaps, that's rather inefficient and often quite chilly. Why don't we do it differently? Of course not. It was the information technology gave rise to a fundamentally new way of delivering the domestic banking service. So to and all. Our challenge today for you and for all of us working in legal technology is not so much, so much to automate what we already do, it's to innovate, it's to find new ways of delivering legal service. And there's never been, it seems to me, a more important time to think about doing this because we're seeing three great drivers of change in the legal profession. And I argue that these three drivers, more or less liberalization of technology, in combination over the next decade, will change the legal world to a greater extent 
that we've seen change over the last century. Let me say a little bit about uh, the first two and then expand on the technology for the rest of my presentation. So the local less challenge captured, I think so effectively, by general counsel will often tell me three things. Firstly, they're under pressure to reduce their external spending. Secondly, they're under pressure to reduce their internal headcount. And thirdly, they say they've got more legal and more compliance work to do than ever before. That's the fairly standard narrative around the world when I speak to in-house lawyers at a senior level. What they're asking for, I capture their demand as the more for less challenge. How do we find ways to deliver more legal service and less cost? And I think this will underpin, it'll define the next decade of legal service. We have to adjust as legal service providers and as clients to different ways of working so that we can allow the quantity of legal work to be done at a more affordable price. And my answer to all of this for some years has been, uh, uh, indeed, even before I wrote the uh, large question mark in the early 2000s, was the idea of decomposition. Economists call it disaggregation. The breaking down of legal work into component parts so that you can ask in each part what's the most efficient way of doing this work. Historically, what happened was that legal work was, and each, each individual legal matter was dealt with with some kind of monolithic lump of stuff that all needs to be handled in the same way. Once we decompose, we can see, of course, that some work still needs the tradition of craftsmen undertaking what I call the bespoke work. But you also find when you decompose, a great deal of work can be standardized, it can be systematized, it can be made available online, it can even be commodified. And that's my fundamental key, I think, to delivering more for less. So what we need to do is take the cost out of the more routine, the more repetitive, the more administrative, the more process-based work. Document review and litigation, due diligence exercises, rudimentary contract drafting, basic legal research, and many more. We have to find ways of sourcing that differently. That's the more for less challenge. And what I've identified, and this list grows by the day, and there's 16 different ways now of sourcing legal services. The details for today are irrelevant. The general thrust is important. Whether they outsourcing, offshoring, subcontracting, co-sourcing, crowdsourcing, whatever. When I was in practice in the 90s, the choice of the client was, do we do it in-house or do we do it the law firm? Full stop. Now there are at least different 16, 16 different sets of ways, different ways of sourcing new firms. We're very different landscape. So that's the more for less challenge. A little bit about liberalization. You may think in the United States that some of this is relevant for you, but I just want to explain why I think it is. The Legal Services Act 2007 came into force in 2011 in the United Kingdom, and I made a particular English will slightly different. I'm a Scots lawyer. You may sense the trace of an accent here, but I, I am a Scots lawyer, and we've not fully really liberalised the a bit. So anything in the world will really all happen. But what we've seen there is quite remarkable. First of all, ignore anyone who dogmatically predicts what's going to happen. Almost by definition, this is not what it's about. We're letting the market do its stuff. We're liberalising. So that's a lot of new cash, new fund, external funding of legal business, alternative business structure. So new people, uh, entrepreneurs coming into the marketplace, new organizations, banks, building societies, supermarkets, expressing an interest in the delivery of legal services. You can have new lawyers as partners, essentially, in legal business, sharing profits. And what this is saying is an influx, as I say, not just of new capital, new people, but we're seeing new ways of delivering services, new ideas for legal businesses, a real passion for doing legal work in a different way. It's like nothing I've seen before. And certainly you don't see this in, in jurisdictions that haven't liberalized. So what we're also finding is that conventional law firms are themselves having to be more They see competition from beyond. And I think that's because we're looking at liberalization. It's really about new competition in the marketplace. And I, this month, for example, I spent a lot of time in the United States. I've given five talks in, uh, in my talks in the U.S. to mean large firms this, this month alone. And a running theme is even if you don't liberalize, there's new competitors in the marketplace doing work that lawyers used to do. But my feeling is, uh, uh, despite the unsustainable decision, in my view, of the ABA's Commission on Ethics 2020, which essentially rejected on all forms of liberalization, I don't think the U.S. United States legal profession is going to escape. And by 2020, my guess is most states will liberalize. You should survive as lawyers in the United States because you bring value, you, you bestow benefits to those you advise that others can't, not because you essentially regulate all of that. No. I, I deny that the justification of the ABA was largely to protect the 
this isn't to promote access to justice, I think it's a set profession. And I think that's morally than sustainable. But forget the morality for a second. In pure business terms, you and the United States in global legal market are basically competing with liberalized jurisdictions that are supported by external funding that can share profits with entrepreneurs and businesses that have changed the way they work. So I think it'll be a competitive disadvantage. I, it's a slight rant from a Brit, I know that, but I really do think it's time for the US already to be able to that decision. Let's go to the third driver, which is technology, of course, main focal point of much of your event. And I summarize this by suggesting that there are at least 13 disruptive legal technologies out there. These are technologies that individually challenge the way mainly conventional law firms operate. Collectively, they contribute and will contribute very largely to the provision of an entirely new landscape in the law of legal services. So if you are someone in law who charges by the hour to draft documents, you can see very clearly, for example, why automated document assembly is a very threatening and disruptive technology. If you make your money as a lawyer through the appearance in court, then you can see very clearly why online dispute resolution, ODR, is disruptive for you. But is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate together to resolve our differences? Or can we leverage ever more powerful information technology to help us resolve our disputes? Or when you look at something like intelligent search and predictive coding, we know now that in terms of recall and precision for a first level document review, Intelligent search technology and predictive coding and so forth, these latest systems can actually outperform junior lawyers and paralegals. Now, this is classically disruptive in the Clinton Christensen sense. It's not sustaining uh, of the conventional way of doing business. It's interesting to know that sometimes one of the words disruption is slightly like misleading. It's actually disruption, disruptive mainly for the provider, for the conventional law firm, for clients who otherwise perhaps couldn't afford services. For clients for whom this technology streamlines, reduces the cost, reinvents, but makes it all so much more convenient for them, it's far from disruptive. So there's various ways you get disruptive technology. But the key part in all of this is to see that technology, in its various disruptive guises, combines, I think, quite devastatingly with the huge demands to reduce cost and the new players in the market to suggest that the conventional legal profession is under threat. I say that with no grief, but how do I say it with any regret, particularly? Uh, I always can say, and it's not a popular sentiment, but uh, the law is no more there to provide a living for lawyers than ill health is there to provide a living for doctors. It's not the purpose of law, the law to keep us in business. We have to adapt, those of us who are adept at law, to make sure that society's needs of the law are met by us in the most efficient way possible, consistent with the level of quality required. So, trying to make huge change. And I can't help feeling, and maybe you know that old phrase if you are hammer, everything looks like a nail, so that's a little like me, almost every problem that seems to me looks to be solved by one form of technology or another. But I really do think that these three major developments in technology, just to pick out three important ones, uh, will contribute very, very largely to the changes of the uh, Some of these are fairly well known territory, but it's worth bringing them together and just considering the collective impact. The exponential growth in the various part of the power of technology. Uh, increasingly smart systems and social media. There are others, of course, there is Pick Out these three to, to whet your appetite and have a look at the program I know we'll be building upon these throughout the day. We all know, or most of them do, the less people might be possible to move law, not only all the land, but Gordon Moore, man who in said approximately every two years or so, processing power will double or cost will have the same thing, or really the number of transistors that can be put in a chip will double. And Cynics at the time said, well, that's not going to last. Well, no, it's still going strong. In fact, it's less than every two years now. The processing power doubles. And material scientists and computer scientists will tell it's going strong for many decades yet. And what does this mean in practical terms? Well, the two stories I love, if you follow the curve, that's the, this exponential increase in the processing power of computers suggests that by 2020, the average desktop machine will be able to process at the speed of about 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th calculations per second. And neuroscientists will tell you that's about the same processing power as the human brain. Now, in 1973, when I was 12, I held in my hands my first electronic pocket calculator. It's about the same size. It wasn't really a pocket. This is a very big pocket. It wasn't really a pocket calculator at all. It's about the same size as a unit in about 2021 that will have the same processing power as the human brain, which is just remarkable. But as remarkable as this, 
And if you follow the curve by 2050, the average do desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together. Now, you can call me radical, but it seems to me if you can see the day when the average desktop computer has more processing power than all of humanity put together, then it might be time for Lars to rethink, for example, the way we draft documents. It simply cannot be, it seems to me, that all corners of our economy and society are being transformed by the internet and computer technology, and yet somehow lawyers are immune from this. The most documents-intensive, the most labor-intensive, um, information-rather-intensive industry is the legal industry, and yet so many lawyers feel that this technology business is not for them. Yeah, of course, electronic mail and word processing and accounting, we can go further than that. By and large, legal technology hasn't really yet substantially touched the practice of law, but it will. And if you can just imagine this underlying processing power, whether or not it's a, uh, a couple of years out, it doesn't even make any odds. The interesting point for those of you who are sitting there thinking, well, that's 2050, is if you have children, as I have, uh, my 24 year old son, the pupil barrister, by 2050, he'll be the peak of his career. Do we honestly think he'll be drafting skills and arguments with desktop computers more powerful than all of humanity put together? It seems to me an entirely daft proposition. But the interesting thing about of course, is that exponential growth is not just processing power, it's bandwidth, number of internet users, number of websites, hard disk capacity, memory, and so forth. And, and it's just fun to learn, for example, it's the same fact that there are already 5 billion, 5 billion mobile phone subscriptions now. More people have mobile phones now in planet Earth than toothbrushes, for those of you who take an interest in dental hygiene. So let's go on to the second one, smart systems. I don't know, this is the term I use because I'm not really sure what to say. Uh, AI was what I, as I said earlier, wrote my doctorate in. But whether or not conventional AI, the latest generation of AI, are, are actually the underpinning technology to deliver smarter systems, I'm not sure. What I'm completely confident of is so that in a variety of ways, we are evolving all manner of technologies that are allowing computers to be smarter, they're performing. I don't think they're any longer trying to read what human beings do, but they're undertaking tasks that we used to think required human intelligence. And that number of tasks is in the dramatic increase. The way I look at the evolution of all in the legal world in these terms, terribly simplistic, but this gives you a flavor. Those of us who started thinking about the way in which intelligent systems might impact on the law really started in the 80s, a little bit of work earlier, but maybe in the 80s, in what in the way affects that system. So very much the technology was in play in the AI lab from Stanford at the time. It also corresponded to the kind of work that I and a few others were doing in legal philosophy, uh, which suggested that uh, a rule-based approach to legal reasoning and legal problem solving could make sense. It didn't need limit in the 80s, but I've got a talk online from the Reinvent Law Conference, if you want to know in more detail. I look back 25 years, more than 25 years, but I talk about a rule-based system we developed 25 years ago and reflect on, although it was a success then, how it hasn't really borne fruit, that technology. But in fact, people then got more modest in the 90s, they looked at knowledge management instead. Building databases, know how databases, know who systems, they shared with most of it was in an organization. And then the whole game changed again when Google uh, began to take hold and really search became the dominant way in which people started researching themselves uh, through computer technology. Of course, Google never offering the answers to questions. They're not operating like diagnostic expert systems where they're treating the world with know-how, but remarkably powerful nonetheless. What we're seeing in the 2010s in terms of search, and of course, the upsurge of big data, we're realizing in the huge bodies of data that we create the byproduct of our system of uh, across the legal sector, there are embedded, no doubt, incredible insights and correlations and observations that would greatly help us in solving our legal problems. I think we're going to see for much of this decade greater work on improved search on, on big data. And in the 2020s, I think mean, we'll find what I call second generation AI coming into law. Not unlike in some ways what we've seen in Watson. And on any view, the achievement of Watson against Watson, not just in beating two best therapy champions on the TV quiz show, but what they're now doing in medical diagnostics suggests very strongly, in my view, that when that technology is applied in law or similar technology, we're going to have fairly high-powered online legal problem solving at our fingertips. And this, it seems to me, is a, a very challenging future. It's uh, a major disruption for people who think that 
maybe advice is going to be dispensed forever in a conventional way. So going forward, I see that the development of AI in the 20th century, it's not going to be modeled in the human brain. I, I think that's the big difference between first and second generation AI. Much of first generation AI was all about, let's try and understand how the brain works in model, or use the computational metaphor as something that we have understand in the human brain. We're less interested in that now. We're really thinking, how can we use technology, as I said earlier, to allow us to do things that we thought eventually required human intelligence? Much of this is going to be fueled by this unimaginable brute force computing. And it won't just be raw data will have big, it will also be know how, but the banks have frequently asked questions and answers and so forth. Uh, know how gathered and collected and selected from when we need problem solving. Of course, far better speech recognition, that's the language processing. I move towards what some of the commentators call perfect search, which is now you don't retrieve, even with Google, all but only the relevant documents require, as search algorithms improve to keep up all the supply. Our searching will become ever more refined. Then, on top of that, machine learning again quite well exemplifies it in Watson. And I think we're looking to a world where technology will deliver not just straightforward deductive reasoning, as our eye was Watson with in the 80s, but inductive analogical and lateral influence too. A very different world. A world, frankly, in that technology is in place where bespoke human service will act with exception, interacting with systems that seem pretty human in interaction will be more dominant. Diagnostic advisory systems, even planning systems, document production systems, highly intelligent search systems. We'll have, and this may be the subject I, I wish I could hear, final keynote, we'll have knowledge, legal knowledge embedded in all of our systems and processes within the organizations that we work. An online dispute resolution won't just be, which are already very impressive, uh, interaction between human beings, but the AI layer on the thing, it and supplementing it. It'll be smart, it'll be smart system more than high wire. In the 80s, what we had to do essentially build decision trees of expertise and drop it into the computer system. In the future, actually, the technology is going to be a lot brighter and better than simple processing of, of rules. And this will also be underpinned by what I call community legal experience, which brings us on to my third development um, social network. We all know if you're using Windows or one thing anymore and you have some kind of daft error message, the first thing you do is cut, paste, drop into Google, and hey, Presto. Someone out there, uh, at no charge, will provide you with all kinds of guidance to what your problem is. And that's a kind of community of experience. I think we're going to do that in the profession as well. That people will come to share the experiences they have in interacting with the law. And so consultation with online service won't simply be diagnostic tools, but actually a social networking experience. It's very often said by people who interact with the law, not by lawyers, but by lay people that when they have a problem, in a sense, it's almost best to speak to another layperson who's been through the difficult themselves. They speak the same language. That's what we'll get through our communities of legal experience. Social networking has not really taken hold, even in, a, in the slightest way of all, not to say there's not a lot of using systems, although I challenge that as well. Yesterday, I was in a big conference in Wales, and I talked about Twitter, and my general line was there are now half a billion users of Twitter. Um, and Yet, if we met, say, five years ago, and then I often ask, say, in a room of partners, uh, in a partner to treat how many of you use Twitter? And on average, and it, it's about 5%. Uh, and I joke, but it's a serious one. I say to the rest of you, are you looking for it to take off? What's the matter with you? Half a billion users. But what we see here is an example of what I call irrational rejection. It was funny, yesterday in my talk, I was actually in the middle of talking about Twitter, and but surprisingly, uh, some chap just interrupts me and shouts out very aggressively that he didn't have time for Twitter. He started to do some video extra. And I, had to, I, I was actually in the previous slide of Twitter, and I just said, we have here an example of change slides, and it came up, irrational rejectionism. A good, a good moment for me, but the message is how I define this. It's, it's the dogmatic dismissal of a technology with which the critic has no personal or direct experience. And this is the joke of the whole thing. It, it, it's not a joke, it's just terribly serious. It's symptomatic of what's wrong with the legal technology in the legal world. Uh, that lawyers, without knowing about various technologies, reject them all the time. And that applies right across social networking. So, of course, you can socialize them in mean, Facebook and uh, by way of gesture, uh, done something on LinkedIn. It's not really the part, the front part of their life. How is it that most lawyers should find out about their proper clients and their news and activity? It seems to me obvious what you've been doing with Twitter. How is it that you raise awareness around expertise? Not the only channel, 
a lot of powerful channel for thought leadership is Twitter and other forms of social media. And increasingly, you'll find, I think, even different ways, which many of you experience as one example, of actually embracing social media, not simply to connect us, but actually to enable us to empower us uh, and to help us with difficulties of problems. So that's a, a trend that I've written about a little bit, but uh, I'm looking at more detail now. My big message, you don't need to know this in this audience, I'm not saying that, not so much you don't need to know it, I don't need to say it. You, I say this all the time, though, to conventional lawyer audiences, there's no finishing line along to you. And it's such a weird thought, it's such a weird thought that by 2025, the technologies then that will change our lives probably haven't been invented yet. The systems that will be underpinning re-engineering, supporting legal service in 2025, similarly haven't been invented. I find that actually slightly scary, but above all else, really exciting. But the notion that once we're spent, we spend a lot of our IT budget to keep nice, that sort of done technology for the next decade is monstrous. The reality is that technology is changing and changing at an accelerating rate. Putting all of this together leads me to suggest that the legal industry is evolving in three stages, hence the title of my talk. The stage of denial is stage one, the stage of resourcing is stage two, and the stage of disruption is stage three. Denial, we're still in that stage by and large. I'm talking about most of the fleet as it were, and I'm afraid the fleet often does move at the speed of the slowest ship, but most of the legal profession by and large still in the line. Not the people who attend the conference you're, you're uh, hosting, not the people who write and speak about the future of legal services, but mainstream partners, mainstream owners of legal businesses. And mainstream in-house lawyers are still in denial. They're actually thinking it's going to go back to 2006 and 2007 again. So, with horrible pressures on costs, the response from many major clients has been to retender their work, to invite law firms to submit alternative fee arrangements. Law firms keep them made profitable, have often fired lots of people, and duly submitted alternative fee arrangements. But we all know in our heart these alternative fee arrangements, by and large, they give at best a 10, 12 percent reduction fee. Clients are saying to me they want a 30 to 50 percent reduction over the next three to five years. The reality is, this period of denial, which I think will last until the end of 2015, when the mainstream will still be thinking, actually, we can go back to the old way. Uh, this period of denial is a period where actually most people are hoping for no real change. We have to move to the second stage, where what I call resourcing. That becomes the last another five years. This is where we take the routine and repetitive work, and we outsource it, we offshore it, we subcontract it, uh, and so forth. We find different ways of undertaking this work. Uh, and that's what I call alternative sourcing strategy. And that will drive out quite a lot of savings. Uh, but the key point from this, for the in-house lawyers in the room, is this is not the problem. In-house lawyers suffer from all the same efficiency uh, about having routine work being done by fairly well-paid people in the bottom of the metropolitan pyramid. And so you see in stage two, 2015, 2015, 2020, alternative sourcing will become fairly standard. Uh, what's done in mainstream advisory law firms is the complex work that generally requires bespoke attention or, or, or certainly requires um, experts or partners or associates, but a huge amount of the more routine work is bespoke in different ways. Taking us through, I argue, to around 2020, where disruption is really going to take hold. That's not to say there aren't already disruptions in place. I love the quotation, many of you will know it, from William Gibson, the science fiction writer, who says, the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. I think that's the case. We're already seeing people who are embracing disruptive technology. But let's not fool ourselves when we get at this kind of event. And as I go about my daily business, we can't think that this is mainstream. There's still huge amounts to be done. But in this era, all the technology that was mentioned, whether it's online dispute resolution, automatic document production, intelligence search, uh, online price comparison and reputation systems, online options for legal services, and so forth, a whole bundle, I've mentioned 13 of the technologies will not just be in evidence through the rare case study, but will become pretty much mainstream. And that's why I think we're moving from a period of denial now into the 2020s, where conventional legal services will be highly disruptive. Let me finish then, ladies and gentlemen, with three challenges. The first challenge for law firms. The question I ask is this. What parts of your work could be undertaken differently? By which I mean more cheaply or efficiently, or for higher quality, using alternative methods of working? That's the first question. Because if you as a person in a law firm can see different ways of sourcing, for example, your routine work, we're now in the marketplace with other providers 
whether it be the legal publishers or the parents of the that we do. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, PwC has now got 2,000 lawyers in certain different countries. The biggest law business in the world is Thomson Reuters. There are new players in the market who can be with conventional legal service providers, conventional law firms, and are adding value that law firms can't at prices that are often far lower. So that's the challenge. We have to think of an alternative sourcing. Here's the challenge for law schools. Just one simple question. What are we training young lawyers to become? As I travel the globe, and I think, I hope Stanford's an exception, but by and large, most law schools are training their lawyers to become 20th century lawyers, not 21st century lawyers. When I present this kind of set of ideas to young law students, their main reaction is, why is no one told before? We have no idea. The future for our young lawyers, I think, it's not John Grisham, it's not Rumble in the Billy, it's not Suits, it's not one-to-one -one consultative advisory service in the part of the basic. It's something very different along the lines I think that I've been discussing today. So we have to ask ourselves the question, the extent to which the legal training we're offering our young law students have any relevance to the future of legal practice. I'm not saying for a second we shouldn't teach core politics like constitutional law and contract. Of course we should. But there's a far wider range of skills and areas of expertise, legal risk management, legal process analysis, legal knowledge engineering. That also has to be the stuff of legal training in the future. And finally, for clients, we have what I call the shareholder test. And the shareholder test, I can give a version of it for today's monthly. Imagine a shareholder, a non-lawyer, or maybe indeed a, a board member of a major corporation, a major financial institution, sits through today's conference and hears about all the different ways that legal services can be sourced. All the new savings that can be achieved through the use of imaginative technology. All the new ways that we can work as lawyers. Would they honestly go back and think of what's going on in their in-house legal department? In the organization of which they are directors, or in the organizations of, in which they are holding, would they honestly think they're getting value for money? Hardly an in-house legal department in the world satisfies the shareholder test. So there's the challenges. It's for lawyers to think whether or not you're sourcing your efficiency. Efficiently, it's for law schools to ask the question, what are we training our young lawyers to become? And it's for in-house lawyers to ask the question, what are really the way they work is in the best interest of the company that they are. And my suggestion is that after a day at your event, almost everyone, as I say, would fail the shareholder, shareholder test. That's partly because, and I want to congratulate you, you put together, I think, such a, a wonderful program. I really wish I was with you there, but I hope my words have uh, whetted your appetite and we'll hopefully be the foundation for some later discussion. Thank you very much. I can hear a few more if you could hear that thank Hello? Richard, can you still hear us? I can hear you, yes, indeed. Yeah, great. Well, I want to thank you for uh, your time this morning. Um, and uh, I think we're going to move on to the next uh, panel, if that's all right. I think the AV has been a little off, I, if everybody, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think, uh, th thanks for your time, and, and I think this presentation was, was great. I think it sets the stage, really, for, for today. So thank you very much. Great, thanks.